Beautiful. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Bunky Clinic Virtual Visiting Professor Series. Uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We have the honor of uh, welcoming a very dear friend of the clinic, uh, Professor Sarah Mexico. Um, I'm going to spend a few slides going over the, uh, Dr. Clifton's background um, and then a few photographs, and then we'll go ahead and start with his talk on uh, brachial plexus and the concept of the internal splint for nerve surgery. Um, Dr. Clifton obtained his um, uh, medical degree uh, from the Dr. Ignacio Chavez um, uh, Hospital Medical School. Um, he then completed general surgery at the 20th of November Hospital, which is the uh, at the date that commemorates the Mexican Revolution, um, uh, along with uh, Baylor College of Medicine. So he trained both in Mexico and the U.S. He subsequently did his plastic surgery training at the same hospital in Mexico City, um, and then followed by hand surgery, um, not only in Mexico, but also at the Kleinert Institute, as well as the University of Texas in Houston. Dr. Clifton trained in microsurgery, peripheral nerve, and brachial plexus under some of the giants in the field, uh, Dr. Graham Lister, Dr. McKinnon, um, the Mayo Clinic. Um, he has been a guest professor um, all over the world in Mexico, the China, and these are um, topics ranging from brachial plexus, peripheral nerve, and hand surgery in general. He's an adjunct professor of hand surgery at the Jalisco Institute of Plastic Surgery. He is a past president of the Mexican Society for Surgery of the Hand. Um, he is the chairman of hand surgery residency um, at his home institution in Guadalajara. Uh, he's also the chairman of the brachial plexus and nerve surgery fellowship, and he is a professor of the International Brachial Plexus School. Um, Dr. Cl Dr. Clifton um, runs the uh, Cl Clinica de Mano, uh, Clifton Navarro, um, and they specialize in, in all types of hand surgery from, um, from everyday stuff to very, very complex microsurgical reconstruction. Um, and uh, he was actually, um, uh, he organized um, a couple of years ago, or about a year and a half ago, a very, very interesting total hand transplant course in 2018 as a tribute to Harry Bunke. Um, this was a, a phenomenal program, and uh, Dr. Greg Bunke and Dr. Rudy Buntik both attended this, and um, they basically came back with um, with nothing but praise uh, for the quality of the program and for the speakers, um, and they covered everything from great toe, second toe, toe joints, web space flaps, and also just in, in general management of the amputated finger and the residual finger. Um, what was really in interesting is, is I was able to get these photographs um, from Dr. Bunke and Dr. Buntik, um, that uh, in Dr. Glifton's house, he actually has basically a microsurgery lab, which is really amazing. Um, uh, this is true dedication uh, for an educator to basically have this set up for folks to be able to come in and train. And you can see Dr. Neil Ford Jones there as well, who is one of the invited um, speakers. Um, th both Greg and Rudy uh, really were impressed with the hospitality in general. Um, you can see the middle picture here is, is Dr. Clifton's office, uh, the two of them enjoying a glass of wine with Dr. Clifton, and they really raved about just the general hospitality and the food, um, and obviously the scientific program itself that, um, was incredible. Dr. Clifton has um, such program once the pandemic has quieted down a bit. Uh, but one of the themes of, of the event, obviously, was uh, uh, giving tribute to Harry Bunke, who really was uh, the person who um, thought of the concept of the free, kind of the total, obviously, as we know, is now one of the mainstays uh, in reconstruction of the hand. Um, one thing that I like about this picture um, is that it's uh, basically Dr. Bunke, but also Dr. Clifton and his son. Um, and uh, I believe Dr. Clifton also has a, um, a son who lives in, in the U.S., and so he travels to the U.S. not frequent, not in, infrequently. Um, and also Dr. Uh, Bunke uh, was very proud of some of the gifts that were given to him as part of this program, and he actually proudly displays um, uh, this uh, toe transplant uh, course, um, uh, basically figurine that was given to him, um, and uh, there's also the plaque, as you can see, which hangs on his wall. So he was uh, very, very proud to be a speaker at this um, event organized by Dr. Clifton to give, um, uh, basically, um, uh, to honor his father, Dr. Harry Bunke. With that, Dr. Clifton, thank you so much for being with us. We're really um, uh, excited about hearing your 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 talk to us tonight. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Safa. Was, that was very, uh, I feel like very honored for everything that uh, you said about myself and, uh, and I'm happy that uh, Dr. Gregory Bonke 
and Dr. Rudolf uh, really enjoyed the, the program. Okay, I'm going to cover two topics and, and this around 45 minutes lecture. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about uh, upper partial brachial plexus palsy, uh, especially the place that the uh, nerve transfer has, and how I do some stuff that can be different without other programs. And also going to talk about a uh, few minutes about internal splinting concept that has, I think has evolved since uh, Dr. Uh, Burhalter uh, first lecture in 1971. Okay, I'm going to talk about injuries, C5, C6, and C5, C6, and uh, C7. One uh, of the most interesting aspects of, uh, of uh, looking into the history of uh, nerve transfers is that in 1930s, this is a little more than over 100 years ago, even before we have the concept of microsurgery, peripheral nerve surgery, micro, uh, microsutures, uh, there, there was a book that was published, the Orthopedics in 1930, by Professor Oscar Bupius and Dr. Adolf Stoffer. And this, uh, this image that you see are part of the work of Dr. Adolf Stoffer. So you can see here that uh, there is a dissection, the anterior approach, anterior axillary approach. Uh, there is a, a segment of the radial nerve, and it, it can be part of the part of the nerve that goes to the long portion of the triceps. And you can see it here much better. You can see there the tendon uh, of the uh, latissimus dorsi, and under everything is the axillary nerve. So the mini suture with small sutures of the, that segment of the rail nerve inside of the axillary nerve. So that may be the first nerve transfer, first uh, terminal to lateral nerve transmotor. Uh, we don't know the results, but it seems that uh, this was very interesting. This was in 1913. And you can see also the deep understanding of the anatomy. So you can see here the terus minor muscle, the all the latissimus dorsi, and where is the X? That is the sensory branch. This is a section that I did. That you can see here is the 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 posterior cord, uh, and the upper right segment is the radial nerve. So down is the axillary nerve, where you can see part of the teres major, then go lower, teres minor, the sensory branch, and the different uh, segments of the anterior and posterior branch of uh, the, the deltoid muscle. You can see here something uh, about, about. In uh, 1948, it was published a paper by uh, Alexander Lurgen from Russia. And he ha has a bold more the concept about nerve transfer for a shoulder, but also for the musculocutaneous. So when we classic think about doing uh, a nerve transfer, well, we should always, always do a brachial plexus exploration when there is a, a brachial plexus injury, even it's partial upper. Don't go and jump straight to the nerve transfers. Only if there is an avulsion or it has passed uh, more than six, eight months, okay, we can do, think first in the nerve transfers, but always do the exploration and reconstruction, especially in birth brachial plexus. Because if you don't do the brachial plexus uh, reconstruction, 
you, you will give a lot of problems to the baby, especially sensory in the hand, innervation at the joint. We have a lot of big problems in those kids. Okay, we can see here, there's two patients with uh, upper brachial plexus injury, no shoulder, no elbow. And uh, one has triceps, and the other one doesn't have triceps. Okay, so, and both has pretty good hands. So, in the case that we think about neurotransfer, because the timing or the abortion, we think, in, I personally do four neurotransfers, two for shoulder and two for uh, elbow flexion. So, number one will be a spinal accessory. You can see it here to the suprascapular. That's pretty easy, anterior approach, but if there's a a lot of trauma involving because it's high speed, high energy, or if there's some fracture that we have of the scapula, then we think in posterior approach. Or we check that the nerve is working fine and the transfer goes like really easy, goes pretty good. Uh, who, uh, sometimes, we have uh, an axillary nerve injury. And in this patient that we have an axillary nerve injury, uh, these patients can, some can have complete normal range of motion. So the only way, the only way that we know is because of the muscle atrophy. If we look for EMG and uh, you can see it has full abduction and external rotation. But these patients, if uh, they can have the axillary nerve injury, it can be in several places. It can be under the pectoral minor, that is an, a place that we can have, or can also be at the quadrilateral space when it's going. So if uh, how do we know if it's under the pectoral minor or the uh, quadrilateral space by physical exploration? And we can also have, uh, can have a good EMG testing. So if you, so, uh, you think that it's in the pectoral minor, we can go up the approach of the accelerator approach. In the quadrangular space, we'll think in the posterior approach. This is a picture we have all the names and uh, different nerves and tendons. Uh, it's a cadaver dissection of the posterior, core, uh, posterior cord and all the branches that we see very often. We look and the axillary nerve and the lower segment is the one that goes to the teres minor. And you can see it here in the lower segment. For us, it's very important to re-narrate the teres minor branch. And we can hear, we can see here the different segments of the axillary nerve. So we like to reinvert the axillary nerve, the anterior branch, and the teres minor branch. Uh, Dr. Samsak, he started using the posterior branch, uh, the posterior approach, and uh, he takes. Uh, the long segment of the triceps, but he doesn't do a renovation of the teres minor because he said that the teres minor is an abductor, and so that will be against what we're trying to see uh, an, an, an abduction. We're going to discuss, discuss this point a little later on. Uh, we start doing several years ago uh, posterior approach, just like really easy and uh, taking the long segment or the median segment of triceps. You can see it here, it's an uh, it's, uh, easy approach and it's always convenient to look at the nerve very carefully that you are trying to 
use as a donor and the recipient also. And uh, we later on start doing also the renovation uh, through the posterior approach of not only the anterior branch, but also, as I mentioned, the terse minor branch. You can see it here. Uh, around six years ago, uh, talking with uh, my dear friend, Dr. Bertelli, he was uh, giving me a lot of details and teaching me how he likes to use the anterior approach. And the anterior approach, uh, this is the one I like it very much. And you can see here that this is the segment of the uh, tribes long branch. And uh, you can see here the axillary nerve divided into the anterior and posterior divisions. And you can see there the branch of the terse minor. And uh, it can go really easy. So we go a little more distal when the uh, uh, the the nerve, the branch of the long segment of the triceps, divides, and we use it for the anterior division and the third uh, There's publications that yes, third minor is an adductor, but it's only an adductor in early abduction. That's around 45 uh, degrees of, of abduction, but after 60 degrees is an a b doctor abductor so it's not longer an abductor but it's also an abductor and you can see here the moments are under different publications that uh, support that the third minor is an abductor and more and more uh, surgeons think that the best possible external rotation you can get, you, you should always include the terus minor. So this is growing up uh, a movement about that. This is a beautiful gem uh, uh, from 1500 before uh, Christ. It's uh, three centimeters small. Uh, you can see a warrior, it's a Greek warrior that uh, having a, a really bad injury. Okay, so for elbow, we like to do the overline two. That means take part of the median nerve and part of the ulnar nerve to reinnervate not also the biceps, but also the brachialis. So we should always look for the anatomy, normal anatomy, but we have to consider that there is a a good amount of variation of the musculocutaneous nerve. And you can see in this picture, one of the variations from me, uh, median nerve to musculocutaneous look different patterns of musculocutaneous, uh, uh, really different innervation. So uh, we really have to welcome this procedure to Dr. Christoph Oberlein. His procedure has been considered the most advanced procedure in the last 30 years in peripheral nerve surgery. It's amazing. So as I was mentioned, I like to use part of the median nerve to re the biceps and part of the ulnar nerve to re the brachialis. And it's always very good to look the muscle that you're going to reinnervate to, to look that goes to the muscle. So you don't make mistakes. Always consider the fascicular pattern, how it change inside the nerves. That's the work of uh, Sir Sidney Sunderland. And this is especially important and neurotransfer because I don't I don't like to dissect a lot the donor nerve. You can see there are some fasciculars that change very fast. So what I do as I try to dissect the less possible the donor segment, 
this is the, the middle nerve, and bring a lot of the from the recipient nerve. And you can see how the plexiform pattern of the nerve go change from proximal to distal. And this is a work of from uh, Michael Javile. And you can see here all the different motor and sensory uh, components of the median nerve. What are the nerves that we're going to, the, the muscle segments that we're going to use, and also from the ulnar nerve. This is the ulnar. So we take the segment from the median nerve that is between two and three. <clears throat> That's where that left eye is. And the segment they're going to turn from the ulnar nerve is between nine and 10. So those are the segments that we like to take for, you can see it here. And as, as I was mentioning, I like to take longer the segment that is going to be the recipient very long so they reach the nerve and i just take in a small segment of the nerve so we have here some pre and post-operative cases and <clears throat> actually this is like a really good procedure that uh, we can have uh, almost uh, normal range of motion in a little over 60% of our patients. Pre-op and post-op. Pre-op, post-op. Free up, post up. We have here a patient with bilateral uh, upper brachial plexus injury. Uh, he's an architect. It was like really bad for him. You know. And th this patient was our first patient that uh, uh, we did. Uh, like more than 10 years ago. Okay, now I'm going to talk about some concept of internal uh, splinting. So in 1971, Dr. William E. Burhalter presented in the ASSH meeting in San Francisco, actually, a paper of early tendon transfer in upper extremity peripheral nerve injury that was published three years later in clinical orthopedics. And uh, he says that during the nerve uh, repair, sometimes it's good to also do a procedure that you do not need to wear an external splint. So that's why we call it internal splint or dynamic splint also, because it's also dynamic. And uh, I'm going to show some cases that this is a, a patient with a a median nerve injury. Uh, she was uh, uh, having a carpal tunnel release, and uh, it was uh, pretty bad. And the scopic carpal tunnel release. So she had all the median nerve damage. So we repair the nerve and also, well, did the the transfer, the tendon transfer. Why doing the tendon transfers? In, uh, in this patient, they were so distal. Well, you know, the issue is that uh, there are some meta-analysis, uh, but the uh, reason that uh, he says that uh, the median nerve, even if it's so distal, doesn't have 100% of recovery. So this patient was really mad of her nerve injury because uh, she said that her hand works perfectly. 
So maybe it was unnecessary, can be, but with the internal splint, patients can start using their hand really early and uh, that help us help help them a lot when there's an ulnar nerve injury i like to do a, a boilerplate advancement on a dermoplasty it's like not, not really a, a, like a tendon or a brand reconstruction but is it just help them to avoid the the claw hand not all the patients have a claw hand this is especially important when we have median and ulnar uh, nerve injury and palsy when it is bigger so it's good to have the thumb and also the the ulnar nerve reconstruction and this is like good because patients that uh, have a claw hand or they will have a better function of the extremity and without the need of uh, the splint. It's not like something that uh, if we don't use this, they need to wear a splint for several months. And uh, and even this patient had really bad median and, and ulnar nerve injury. Uh, this is true also in radial nerve injuries or transfers that uh, we like to use the pronator terrace besides of the reconstruction. In this case, we did uh, median to radial. And the issue was because this patient uh, had a gunshot wound injury eight months before. So we really need, he wanted the best possible uh, function that it was possible. So you can see that uh, the recovery of his function was quite remarkable. And this is the only procedure okay. that vamos a give independent motion primero. of the fingers. Eso, okay, estirábamos. El meñique que sigue. Ok. Estiramos. Ahora el puro dedo índice. El índice, se ve ser. Estiramos. Otra vez el índice, despacito. Ok. You can see the really bad cloud in other hand. Ok. Now. I'm going to, I, I live close to a church, so you can listen. So this is an, a special case. This is a, a patient, a uh, 32 year old female that uh, eight months before she had a, a thy thyroid cancer removed. Uh, and you can see the scar that goes from one ear to the other ear. But it seems that uh, the surgeon, the oncological surgeon removed all the uh, the tumor, all the cancer, but uh, she was like, uh, you can see with winging of the right arm because he has injured the spinal accessory nerve. And uh, it was not only that she cannot do a good abduction, but she also had uh, really painful uh, uh, trying to make an abduction because of the winging of the scapula. And uh, so, let me see. So I I try to see how look how bad. It was the winning that she had. That was kind of painful for her, for her. She 
she had uh, the injury uh, eight months before the surgery. But I decided to do a <coughs> spinal surgery nerve reconstruction with a, a motor nerve graft. I have been using motor nerve graft, believing in the concept of Thomas Bruchard of selective motor renovation. So sometimes when I have a pure motor nerve injury that we need a graft, I like to take that graft from uh, the one branches of the dorsal. So you can see here, that is the incision, and we have different branches of the dorsal. So I can use that uh, and then do the reconstruction. Uh, the issue is that was eight months after the injury. There have been published different uh, ways of reconstruction of spinal accessory. Also, we, there are several uh, nerve transfer from pectoral nerves to uh, C7 transfers. There are different uh, transfers, but I did uh, a contralateral uh, middle and lower uh, trapezium transfer. And I made a hold and the scapular under the scapular spine. So we had the scapular spine and under a middle hole, uh, that was, uh, uh, this is not a patient, but it was something like this. I we, we really like to use a lot of trapezium for, uh, for transfers. Uh, Dr. Bassam uh, is, uh, has been with us and he teaches how to use in a lot of ways uh, the tendon transfer. So this is the patient uh, four months after the the transfer. This is pre-op. I'm sorry. Okay, this is pre-op and post-op. Okay, and this is her like six months after the procedure. It seems that the trapezium started to have some recovery. Uh, she is pain free. Um, cancer free, it seems also. Okay, with the function. Okay, I hope you don't like bulls, bulls fight, but. Uh, it used to be very popular in Mexico and Spain, but it's not that popular anymore. Every every time it's less and less popular. But one time, I, 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 like six years ago, I went to see a, a bullfight and I was like every amateur uh, photographer, I was filming. So I saw when the the bull catch the bullfighter on the leg. You can see him. And immediately the bullfighter was not able to do a dorsiflexion. Look, he has a, a foot drop. So this was in a uh, close to Guadalajara, in a town that's Aguas Calientes. So I said, this guy must have a peroneal nerve injury. 
or at least TVL. So I said, I called my friend, said, you know, I will perform surgery to this uh, bullfighter for free. So look how his leg is like. So two hours later, I was doing the surgery to this uh, bullfighter. And uh, so you can see there are the segments of the nerve and the uh, blue circle, uh, branches of the peroneal nerve going to anterior tibial. And I also like to do in, in adults uh, a posterior tibialis uh, tendon transfer. So I did that to this, and one year later, he invited me again, but he was not able to walk anymore. I said, man, I thought that I did a good surgery. But then he started walking, and he had a good recovery of the nerve injury, uh, I guess because uh, he was lucky that uh, we had the nerve reconstruction done really fast. And I also think that the uh, posterior tendon transfer also helps. And this is him after okay let's see okay okay great i think uh, i have uh, a couple of minutes left i hope and uh, i would like to talk a little about uh, what we're doing in mexico in mexico we started 10 years ago uh, having a fellowship in brachial plexus and peripheral nerve injury. So we started really local with uh, six uh, orthopedic and hand surgeons, also plastic surgeons uh, from our country. And uh, it has grown. Now we have uh, fellows from all over Latin America and Central America and the Caribbean, also a couple from the United States. So most of the South America countries, we have uh, fellows trained in brachial plexus and peripheral nerve. And this has also grown. And uh, uh, two years ago, we started with Dr. Alex Musset, Anil Bhatia, and Dr. Tarek, uh, the International Brachial Plexus School. That is a, a, a rotating uh, fellowship that uh, you go and travel to India for a week, then to Egypt, to Barcelona, and to Mexico. So I think education is very important. And uh, we need more neurosurgeons and brachial plexus surgeons uh, around the world. So I think it's something that we should really consider. Uh, it was supposed to be. Next year, the 11th Congress of the World Society of Reconstructive Magic Surgery in Cancun, but unfortunately has been postponed because of this crazy coronavirus. So thank you very much. Jorge, thank you so much for this fantastic talk. Um, first of all, congratulations on the fellowship and the international plexus um, program that you set up, I think, Education is such an important part of what we do and what you do specifically, um, because obviously you want these techniques and everything that you've learned over your long career uh, to be passed on to the next generation. So congratulations on that. And I'm really glad to, to see that you even had Americans doing your fellowship, which is great. Um, I think in general, a lot of Americans uh, tend to stay here uh, for their fellowships and, and not, um, not too many go overseas. So that's really good to, to see that. So congratulations on that. How many fellows do you have in your uh, peripheral nerve and plexus fellowship? We have six. Wow, 
six fellows. That's incredible. Yes, that's uh, we have uh, a good amount of uh, patients, uh, adults, and uh, and also uh, birth bracket plexus palsy. The fellowship uh, was designed uh, for working surgeons. Mm -hmm. uh, so the fellowship is one week of interns work every two months. So uh, it's in a year that will be six weeks of intense uh, work. Misconnect there. Hmm? Okay, so uh, so the, the the fellows travel from different countries and stay in in Mexico for a week, and during that week we have between sixteen to twenty brachial plexus surgeries mm -hmm. and we see about 60 patients and every night we have lectures lectures and discuss cases and discuss uh, surgeries so it's very intense for a week we start at 7 a.m and finish around midnight every single day for a week then they return two months later and it's so it's one year but it's six week of intense work got it <clears throat> that's a very interesting concept um and how many surgeons do you have as part of your fellowship okay uh assistant professors i also have six hmm. so it's a, a lot, and we have around three ors running at the same time so the six fellows are divided in three groups so they are all the time at surgery Got it. And um, in Mexico, is the brachial plexus and peripheral nerve field um, essentially dominated by plastic surgeons, or do you also work with orthopedic surgeons who do peripheral nerve and brachial plexus? Well, uh, it's dominated by hand surgeons that can be either plastic or orthopedics. I think that the way to go in the future, it's going to be a little more into uh, hand surgery because uh when i was doing my hand surgery fellowship in louisville that was a long time ago you know a hand surgery was trained to do everything like the bone work the tendon work the soft tissue nerves and vascular work like in the old days very very old time ago in mexico if there was a, a hand that was amputated it to be reimplanted they mm -hmm. called a vascular surgeon and an orthopedic surgeon and a plastic surgeon and a neurosurgeon to do the nerve it was crazy so and so i think that a, sur a well-trained surgeon should do everything and we do everything we do pre-functional muscle flaps we do osteotomies arthrodesis tendon transfers and nerve transfers uh, peripheral neural construction mm -hmm. everything <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as as they say, you know, hand surgery is an area specialty, not a tissue specialty. So I think that does make a lot of sense. Uh, your your concept of the internal splint is really interesting, and I think um, it makes us think about it more often, and we don't quite think about it as much. <clears throat> um, the question I had for you was, at what point do you make the distinction between an internal splint that you've done by a tendon transfer versus a formal tendon transfer? Okay. Uh... Number one is in, in adults because in kids uh, we you sh they, they recover so good so we don't will not think usually like in the internal split in kids but let's say in adult if the patient has a possibility of recovery if I think it has then it will be an internal splint mm -hmm. uh, with the nerve reconstruction. If I don't think it has a good potential of recovery, I will think in a formal uh, tendon transfers. Got it. That, that makes sense. And then with regards to your nerve transfers, there were excellent cases and, and really good examples of um, the Leach of Engvang transfer and the Oberlin transfer and so on. 
you very briefly mentioned the contralateral C7. <clears throat> um, it's a bit controversial here in the U.S. with regards to the, cont the contralateral C7. We do know that some of our Chinese colleagues have had good experience with that, especially with the kind of the prevertebral uh, tech uh, um, route, if you will. Uh, do you have any experience with the contralateral C7, and what are your thoughts on it? Uh, we have done a lot of cases of a contralateral C7, and the model results hasn't been the best uh, that we can get. So I think for us, it's like a growing experience. Mm -hmm. So I cannot say something definitive, but my dear good friend, Anil Bhatia, mm -hmm. he has tons of experience. He has spent some time with Dr. Wang in Beijing, and he's a very good advocator of uh, contralateral C7. But at the present time, I use it mainly to give some sensation of the hand. Mm -hmm. so, and I have also used it to have some motor nerves, uh, fascicles also, to plug a muscle, uh, a functional muscle uh, free flap. But I, I don't, at the present time in ALS, I don't do it trying to have some intrinsic hand function or even elbow function. So I am still growing. Um, I cannot say something definitive about going forward or against. Got it. Uh, and then a, a last question um, that I had uh, before we open up to questions from the audience. Um, you did mention also that you prefer to use motor uh, nerve grafts to fix a motor nerve. And obviously based on uh, Tom Brushart's work, and, and there are a few other folks around the, <clears throat> around the world who like to use motor nerve grafts. Um, a lot of that work obviously was based on basic science or, or at least animal data. Um, my question for you was, um, have you noticed a difference or, or an improvement in motor nerve re regeneration with your patients? Um, and do, are you aware of any um, human clinical uh, data that where you can compare motor nerve grafting versus sensory nerve grafting? I have been using the motor nerve grafts for the last 15 years. Uh, I don't use it very often. I have used it like in around 10 patients. So I cannot say that I have the data, mm -hmm. you know, that is much better than the sensory. But to me, it makes sense. Usually the functional recovery is good. Uh, maybe compared to the sensory nerve graph. But uh, I believe in the basic, basic science data and, uh, and I I do it because I think it's the right thing to do. And especially, it's so easy to take a small segment of a branch of the torque dorsal. You have the injury that is uh, the, the incision that it's like really not uh, so noticed. And uh, also, we don't use the, the serial nerve and that, that gives more problems like a couple of weeks to start walking and the swelling at the foot. And uh, the timing to me, it's the same, taking a small branch. So if I need like small segment, a pure more nerve graft, uh, nerve graft I, I will prefer to use this. Got it. And what's the uh, limit of length that you've used these motor nerve grafts uh, for? Well, I have taken like for almost uh, 15 centimeters, 15, 18 hmm. centimeters. Oh, very long. I don't denervate the latissimus dorsi completely. So it's just part. So it still works. Got it. Great. Yeah, I'm, I don't really have much experience with that. Uh, but it's something that I've always been interested in. So I was curious to see um, see what, what your thoughts are on that. <clears throat> well, Dr. Clifton, thanks so much for a fantastic lecture. Um, we, we really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to uh, including this in our visiting professor virtual library that we have. And also, I'm looking forward to hopefully visiting you in Mexico as well at some point. That would be awesome. Uh, Dr. Safa will be honored of uh, having you as a guest in our Great. clinic. Thank you so much, and, and we hope to uh, see you soon in person, 
and uh, please stay safe down there. You too, sir. Great. Take care. Have a good night. You too. All right. Uh, bye bye. Bye.